What's up, friends? It is 1030 Eastern Time. It is Thursday. It is time for Thinking on Paper. I'm Jeremy Gilbertson. One of your co-hosts, as always, is Mr. Mark Fielding with me. Mark, how's go? How's it going in the land of snowboarding and the Alps, sir? It, it, yeah, hello, Jeremy. Hello, Josh. Um, it's going great. And this week, um, I've been working on the Thinking on Paper website, thinkingonpaper.xyz. You probably say Z, but we have we have the Web3 domain name and we are live. So that's what I've been working on this week when I haven't been having fun. Um, could I just say, like for today's show, I just I bought a prop oh, nice. just to kind of as a kind of a, a, a thought to keep in our minds during ah. the show. So this normally sits on my wall just here, but I've taken it off. And these are my some of my tickets and you know they date back to metallica black album 996 so you know these go back a long way and i think you'll, you'll notice the date they stop is when we started getting pdfs for tickets and that was one of the low points of my life is when they stopped <laughs> these like i'm in the memory making business and this is what this is a kind of a something i want to keep in mind as we're talking to josh because um yeah, definitely a topic we can get into. What a great prop and, and a great uh, great segue, unplanned segue. I feel really good about this transition. Uh, Josh Katz, welcome. We're so we're so excited to to have you here. I know you've been uh, doing a lot of things for for a while. You've been at this intersection of of you know tech and, and music for a very very long time. You've done some really interesting things early on in the Web three space. You've iterated a bunch, and you're in you're in the machine, man. And uh, excited to reconnect. Uh, welcome to the show. Great to be here, guys. Hey, you know, excited to talk to you guys. Awesome, awesome. Well, hit us hit us with a hit us with kind of a a quick little background on on the little different moments on this journey that you've been on for a while. Maybe some of the ones that have helped shape what you're doing now and and why you're doing it. You mean as far as the Yellow Heart journey? Just the Josh Katz journey to start oh. there, and then we'll jump into to the Yellow Heart piece. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, since as far as I can remember, I've been a passionate, you know, music fan, uh, recorded music, live music. You know, I'm a guitar player. Um, I grew up in a household where my father was a guitar collector, so every room was filled with instruments. Um, you know, you know, stringed instruments, banjos, mandolins, guitars. Um, so it's just been, you know, ingrained in me for a really long time and uh, something I'm super passionate about. So just always been on a music path. I uh, spent some years at, at the record labels, uh, mid 90s up until early 2000s. Uh, then I started a company called EL Media that became a elevator music company. So if you think about the premier elevator music company, we all you know don't ever think about, but you probably know the name Muzak. Um, the name has really become an adjective for kind of bad music also, you know, yeah, canned music, yeah. so to speak. So, um, you know, back in the, you know, early mid 2000s, I, I basically was brought about good music in venues and started the company around having DJs make cool playlists and using licensed music and using, you know, charging the, the brand more and the whole theory around, OK, well, you know, these lifestyle brands, hotel brands, retail brands, restaurant groups, um, you know, all of it, casinos, airports, they'll pay more for a better product. So was in that space, which was kind of you know, gray area of the music business, real boring, utilitarian. No one really cares about it. But as DJ culture was rising through like the mid 2000s um, and everyone went from like trying to be a guitar player to trying to be a DJ. It made a lot of sense because like, you know, there was talent out there and just timing wise was worked well. And interestingly enough is that I had a stable of DJs and these DJs would work for us by day or like, you know, we really, you know, and then at night be at all the hottest spots, you know, DJ, uh, whether it's the restaurants on a Thursday night, the clubs Friday, Saturday and Sunday, um, you know, Sunday's a big party night in New York. So like, you know, Monday would be pretty empty in the office, you know, it was all the DJs would be working, but you know, um, they always brought culture and whether it was early sneaker collecting or early, you know, all, all types of interesting stuff. And one of the things that came through the DJ culture of my then business was 
uh, Bitcoin and and um, blockchain. And, you know, I learned about it, you know, probably when a lot of other people in the space learned about it, you know, um, you know, maybe 2013 or so. And um, just kind of got into it. And then as I studied and just kind of learned about the technology, it just became fascinating to me. And I started just realizing that, you know, in around music and intellectual property, it could be the next format, you know, where we had watched, you know, physical product go from vinyl to cassette to CD, which is now digital. It sounds better, but does it really, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and then, you know, really, really terrible, terrible sounding music, you know, Um So through like MP3s, that's just, you know, like, well, you can't even hear the music. It's just like, you know, almost a copy of itself. And now like, okay, this could be the next format. So I started thinking a lot about that. Um, And I had an an exit on that business um, in uh, early 17, late 16, and we closed early 17. And I was just off thinking about the next business, but knew it would involve that. So this is where it gets kind of interesting is that I was really thinking about like royalties and like, you know, you memorialize a smart contract with a work, whether it's any type of media content. And now you have auto distributions of royalties upon play and that becoming like a format. Right. But would the record industry, would the TV, would the movie industry adopt to this format? That's the other question, right? They just got like streaming, right? So Okay, could be slow, maybe not the right timing. So July of 17, I'm deep in the space. um, And my favorite band, Fish, plays 13 shows at Madison Square Garden. So I start going to the shows. And as a devout fish head, I'm going to every show. Not You can't just go to one and call it good. Yeah, Yeah, most of them at least. 13 fish gigs in a row. Yeah, you know, over about a three-week period, you know, there's some breaks. But, you know, it's fun. And it's a great community, especially in New York. Great, great people. Um, so many friends there. It's just, it's just terrific. And the band is, you know, just in my personal opinion, probably the best live band of all time, them and, and the Grateful Dead. Well, there's a lot of them. But um, the point is, is that I started buying tickets on the secondary market. And I started buying, you know, two tickets, one for me and one for my wife. And every night... You think over 13 dates, people would see the show and it would end, but they don't do any repeats. Every song, every show is different and the prices are going up. So imagine now tonight you spend a thousand plus thousand plus fees that are astronomical, like 30, 40 percent fees. So like thirteen hundred dollars for you and, and someone else to go see a concert. Right. And you're like, fuck, this is so fucked up and blah, blah, blah. You know, but you do it. And then the next day you forget about it. Right. But in this case, I had to do it again, and then again, and then again, and then again. And I was like, this is just crazy. Where is this money going? The face value of the tickets is 70 bucks. And it, the light bulb went on. I actually brought it to a Ethereum meetup um, and whiteboarded it. And the whole concept around what I've been doing now was born. So that's kind of the backstory. It's cool. It's it's always good. You know, we, we talk a lot about storytelling on this on the show and, and the idea of like, understanding the beats of the journey to kind of where you're at right now and what fed that. And it's really cool to see the, see the personal connection that, that fires the light bulb. So, um, yeah. the Fish and Ethereum, how important were the Ethereum meetups in, in the yellow heart journey? Was that, was that the spark to, to get it made? So I think I should just like, you know, elaborate on that. So what had actually happened was, this is kind of crazy. So, um, I had sold my business. Um, Jeremy's doing some. That's, camera, that's what we call magic. the zoom in. We call the zoom in right there. <laughs> God, I lost High you production okay. value here, Josh. High production. <laughs> yeah, no, I, all right. So I was alone for a minute. Um, so, uh, um, what, were we, what was the question? Just like kind of elaborate. Go, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So. In, in doing the deal to sell the business, uh, at the last minute, the buyers retraded the lease on my office space. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was just like not the, not the most, you know, not the kindest move on their part, but they did it. And, you know, my advisor said, just eat it. So I, I did. So I basically had an entire floor in Midtown Manhattan that was empty for a year. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, I basically 
to just caveat it, I was the host of the Ethereum meetup. Okay. There you go. You had the space. <laughs> so, put it to use, right? Yeah. So, put it to so use. What, yeah. So what had happened was I look, I was trying to get into the space and I was looking for people who were in the States. And I was meeting, frankly, a lot of like shady people. You know, who probably made a ton of money in the last few years, but like <laughs> at the time, like didn't, you know, just were not my cup of tea at the time. And I, and I started to meet good, credible people. And I basically, a lot of them were young. A lot of them were, you know, out of Ivy League schools or Stanford. And instead of going to like do the summer internship at Goldman Sachs, they were working for a, another fund or two that were reputable in the space. And I literally moved that fund into the office. I gave them a free office space. Yeah, because I had a whole floor. So they moved in. So the, just to answer your question, I was deep in the space. The meetup was happening twice a week in on the floor. But there was also like daily crypto trading activity and business ideas and banks coming in to learn about what crypto even was at the time. Like literally one crypto 101, you know, blockchain 101 was going on. I had a deck called uh, blockchain 101. NFTs 101. We used to, like so like that's what was going on. So it was more than just me. Wasn't me just like showing up at a meetup on a random night. It was like integral into my everyday. What was the energy like in those in those meetups and sessions? So I had my my wife said, "Have you ever seen Silicon Valley?" Oh yeah. So she told me I was early. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so it was very young, um, very smart. Super smart. Um, I think I learned more over the course of 17 in that environment than I learned a, a lot of the years before that. Um, and really, people were there because they knew that it was a new frontier. And we felt everyone felt for some reason that we were like on to something that no one else knew about yet. Yeah. Got it. I wonder, I wonder what those um, blockchain 101 and NFT 101 guides how you would edit those now if they would look the same. So, yeah, no, it's funny. They're like in the yellow heart drives. They're there still. Um, they're pretty funny. They're really rudimentary. And it was me literally like explaining to, you know, tons of people in the entertainment business, like this is what an NFT is. This is why it's this. This is what it does. This is how it's made. This is how, you know. That's a, okay. On that, that's a light. I'm going to just this one. It's a nice link to the Kings of Leon people in the entertainment business, because I think that the Kings of Leon drop was probably the, the, the most famous of all the drops. One of the first, yeah. how, how did that come about? Um, and how, how did it change things for Yellowheart? So, you know, you know, I'll just tell you, so, we were we built ticketing out and we built it out with Ticketmaster pre pandemic. And they became Live Nation Ticketmaster became an investor because at the time I was just like, OK, if I'm going to be able to break into this industry, it's going to be damn hard without these guys. Right. They have a huge monopoly over the space. Yeah. So we joined, we took their money and we built a system that really worked for them and worked into their existing infrastructure. COVID then suddenly happened as we were getting ready to kind of go into beta on it. And when COVID happened, live event ticketing just went like completely awry. So um, when it did, we basically, we went out of business. And essentially what had happened was I then through COVID, I don't know if you remember the pandemic, you're locked down, you're on the phone, you're FaceTiming, you're Zooming, you know. So I started just really reaching out to tons of music managers and artists and everyone's talking you know this is a time where people would talk on the phone for 45 minutes or an hour it wasn't a big deal you know whereas before my conversations rarely went over three minutes you know True. so yeah so we're chatting and i'm just educating and educating and one of the people in that call rotation quite frankly was kings of leon's manager and you know i was kind of reading the landscape and what had happened was the first person that really had the vision on this and stepped up was actually Portugal, the man and their manager, um, brilliant manager, uh, really one of the best out there. And he got it way ahead of everybody. And at the time, Yellowheart was out of business. So I worked with him and put out the first ever, you know, music, you know, 
tokens, so to speak, NFTs on Rally platform with Portugal. That was the PTM coin that you did? Yeah, Yeah. I remember reading that. It was so early and just, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, you know, it was interesting because after ticketing died in like April of 20, finally by the end of 20, after like pounding the phones with everyone and probably annoying the shit out of tons of people, like I um, find like Rich, their manager was, was a brilliant guy. He got it and he was like, yeah, let's do it. So we did it. Um, but now I had a use case. Finally, I was like, oh, God, now I got something I could show people finally. Um, and once I did that, like it became easier for other people to do it. And Kings of Leon happened to just be the right situation because the band before the pandemic was about to release an album. And when the pandemic happened, they didn't release it All right. because their model had always been release an album and tour. And that's where they make their money. So they didn't, couldn't tour. So they didn't put the album out and they sat on it. And it was like, okay, live events will be back in six months. Originally, people were like four months, like in the fall, and then like six months or next year, or like, and it just didn't come back, you know? So by the following winter, after having Portugal the Man, and he saw it, he started to peak interest and agreed. He was like, all right, let's, let's go for it. Let's put this out. And, you know, I basically just told him, this is, it was, you know, obviously myself and, you know, Thomas Emmanuel, who's another partner at Yellow Heart. It was just the two of us and we ideated it and we put it together and just told them what to do. He got artists involved in it and that was it. And we went. It's it. I didn't know you were involved in the, the Portugal, the man stuff. I've been, I've been, that was one of the first ones uh, that I started reading about how, how yeah. has that community done over time uh, with that? Because the interesting part about it is this, this one-to-one artist to fan persistent connection, right? How, how are they doing over time? Have you, it seems to be fantastic. You know, I, I've just with full transparency, I have not been active at, really at all just because, you know, I, I frankly, I just kind of continue to try to push new projects out and make my energy towards kind of pushing things forward. Um, and Rich is, <laughs> their managers like, you know, obviously got it covered. But as far as I know, it's been great for the community where they've had all types of perks for owning, you know, for owning and being part of the community. So, and that, I believe, will continue. So it's been really good. I know a whole catalog was opened up to them of live shows that they were able to access and other really awesome perks for being in the community. Brilliant. Awesome. Let's let's talk about, for, for those of us watching that don't really understand how the ticketing biz works or worked or is now, we're trying to morph into a different version of that. I know you're leading the charge on a lot of that. Talk to us about, like, we know something's messed up, but give us like the short and sweet on the details of why it's broken and what we can, what you're doing or what we're all doing to fix it. So lo- this is, that's like a, another four podcast. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> so it's tough to, <laughs> tough to break that down. Uh, yeah. That's a tough. What's one, the but, biggest break uh, then? What's, what's the most broken okay. in it? So, you know, so I'll, I'll put it like, put it like this. So essentially the, the United States is the only country that allows venues to have non-exclusive ticketing contracts, or sorry, exclusive ticketing contracts, right? So if you own a venue, you could go and say, I'm only ticketing with Ticketmaster, and Ticketmaster will come to you and say, okay, if you're going to sell over the next three years a million tickets, and we're going to add $5 fee per ticket or $10 fee per ticket, that's five or ten million dollars and here's half of it up front right so they go forward and they do these deals that not many other people could really do and that's a problem because it's led to a monopoly it's also led to a lack of innovation in the space and a lack of competition. So that's a pretty big problem. So that just hurts the fan. So if you look at the fan experience for buying tickets, and that's this is really all that matters, um, anyone that's bought concert tickets will agree that it's just not a pleasant experience. And for some reason, when you're a fan of a team, a fan of a artist, you're just not 
given preferential treatment. You're not noticed for your loyalty. There's really no, it's just a pure money thing. And it's gotten to the point because of no competition where all they try to do is maximize the price for every single ticket. And they just want to get like an aisle seat costs more than a middle seat. I mean, like it's just like every scheme you could think of to increase the price and kind of, well, let's add this fee. There's an admin fee, a facility fee, yeah. a city bureau of concert fee. You know, it's like I mean, it's just like it's just ongoing. So it's just gotten pr really bad. You know, if you look at other places in the world where this is not the case then you know there's a lot more competition if you're a venue could really work with any ticketing company if you're an artist and you're going to go out on a tour you have a real partnership you can go to that company and be like listen we're going to co-market and we're going to work on this together and that together and you could work on the tour together not just have this piecemeal situation and then i'm not on the promoter side i'm not on the band side i'm just you know someone who's built technology that could actually just change all of this for the fan and for the artist by also allowing the sharing of those secondary sales. So it de-incentivizes third-party scalpers, and it actually puts the money back in the artist and the, and the team's hands. Um, so it kind of works for everybody. Um, but it, listen, it's a, it's a pretty um, antiquated system that has had no government oversight for some reason, maybe because it's sexy stars, names, and I, you know, and there's been no one, you know, now it's finally seems to be happening. We'll see where it all goes. Um, but there just needs to be some change in, in the regulatory environment. Yeah. I think that one of the big things too, is like all of those inflated, uh, secondary market costs, none of it was flowing back to the artist, Right. And that's the value in the yeah. equation, right? That the tech is just enabling a transaction and, and the tech that enabled the transaction is getting more than the artist. And, and that, that's, that's kind of a broken piece. Well, let's talk about yellow heart and what you guys are doing from a ticketing perspective. I think the last time we talked, and it's been quite a while, uh, you were doing some stuff with, with G love, I think with some, with some ticketing and shows and fandom kind of yep. stuff. What, what's, what's happening? Is that G love and so, special sauce? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, now he's kind of touring his G love, but yeah, I think he's been doing so shows with them too. Cool. So. Yeah, you know, we work with a, a whole lot of artists at this point. Um, G, G is definitely a, fa a family member at Yellow Heart. Um, we are essentially trying to push technology forward that enables the artist and the fan to have a symbiotic relationship where fans get rewarded for good behavior um, and know they're part of a community. And as being part of that community, they get access, perks, benefits, all tiered. And of course, you know, there's different price levels, but essentially putting together just a much more simpler, straightforward system, plus a transparent system. So right now, when you go to buy a ticket, you don't know how many are left. You don't know which are available. You don't, you know, if you go on a secondary, it's just very opaque. Um, and one of the great things is that we are using Web3 technology. So when you get into Web3 technology, you have the blockchain, which is where we issue our tickets on, where everything's transparent. So now imagine going to look at a seating chart and you don't just see like the tickets that like that secondary company wants you to see, you're seeing everything. And now it moves even into a bit ask where I'm just like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna jump on, go see Pearl Jam with Jeremy and Mark. Oh, those guys are in section 108. I can literally message the dude next to you and say, hey, is there any way I could swap or buy your seat? Or, and you build a community. And it starts with that. But then imagine like through the experience, that community being able to interact. Um, and community through music super strong. It's very real. Um, people do this in groups and together. And now they travel. Everyone travels to festivals with their friends all summer. And like it's very, very real. So we're helping build that. But let those communities also be rewarded by knowing that they're they're in like don't stress it like we know you're part of this and you know um we'll get you tickets and then you have all the other people beyond that just seeing a true transparent market one well, not one that's completely and utterly manipulated on centralized servers so the technology is a big part of it um as you look at the web3 umbrella you have blockchain which is you know creates a transparency of markets but then you also have what's called smart contracts 
So a smart contract is when you deploy a NFT, which is what our tickets are, and I'll get to next, you have the contract that says what that is allowed to do, and it's automated. So we could deploy it and say, okay, if this ticket gets resold, take 50% of that lift and send it back to the artist or send it some to the 20% to the artist and 30% to the venue or whatever those splits might be in the contract when the deal is made. So suddenly there's a whole nother pool of revenue in the secondary. The secondary in the U.S. Um, is about 10 billion worldwide. It's about 15 billion um, and the artists don't share in it. And the ones that do have to do it through really like backdoor methods. Right. So um, this enables it and it makes it very also clear to the consumer. If you, you look at the Yellow Heart platform, it says this is the royalty and here's where it's going. And like everyone knows it up front, you know. Um, so that's really important. And then, you know, the other part of Web3 is NFTs. So for us, NFTs are just our ticket stubs. So if you, I'll just lift my phone up literally, but like, you know, Mark, you're like showing me your frame here. Here's like my ticket stub, yeah. you know, and I have a wallet that has them in here. And, you know, for years to come, they'll be here. And like, I could tap on it and like, look at my entertainment value of my ticket, you know? Entertaining. Mm. Yeah. So it becomes fun, you know? I, um, that fun was, was one of the, the, the things I most enjoyed about this move is the fun and it's putting the fun into having a ticket which that's a, that's an important ad that people seem to yeah. ignore yeah it is um you know we're seeing a huge movement right now trend wise in the nft space into membership communities uh corporates jumping on that bandwagon in a big big way um I think you're going to see a lot of artists and teams start to launch those communities where holding the NFT will get you early access to things and other stuff like that. That's going to be the more immediate trend we're headed towards right now. Um, you know, we, we've been doing that, of course, for a while where we gate media content, we gate merch, we gate access to all types of stuff. Um, and it, it works pretty well. It's just it's a little counterintuitive in some models because in some models you want as many people as possible to try to buy something. And you're basically saying, no, we have gates up and only you certain people could buy something. So it really only works on certain use cases. Yeah. So the interesting thing that I always think about is so you have this have this connection between artist and fan on a largely one to one level. And uh, what what could that enable? Because we get a lot of like the artist at a show is basically playing. Right. And the fan is just listening to the broad. Let's call it a broadcast. Right. And it's that it's that one way thing. They're they're listening. They're interacting. They're dancing. Right. But how could this connection up the level of interactivity coming from the audience back to the artist. Well, there's a, there's a lot of cool, you know, companies doing stuff like that. Uh, whether it's, you know, holding like cold plays that people hold up lights that go different colors and like, it makes the whole experience for everyone, you know, more better. Um, you know, fish has done a zillion things over the years that have artists, artists interactivity, but that's just not what we're trying to do as much. We're trying to basically just take, a new model with better technology that's actually really suited for this industry. It actually fits it perfectly and deploy it and get it and get it to scale at this point. That's really where we're at. So, you know, as a company, we've gone through just a ton of evolutions because being early just forces you to try things. And, the, you know, what will be successful isn't always dictated by you. It's dictated by the public. So you throw stuff at the wall and certain things stick and certain don't. Being early, of course, you get a lot of things that don't stick or might stick temporarily. Um, so now where we're really headed as a company is we've built, you know, API white la label technology, which will enable all ticketing companies to partner with Yellow Heart um, and brand their own branding with all of this product product and use it and be able to launch this technology without having to build it themselves. So we're hoping that that will really help because these types of tickets really benefit fans in a big way and they're fun, they're entertaining, collectability, it's just it's it's cool stuff. I like I like the approach on the white on the white label side of the fence just giving now the text built, you know, let people turn it on really easily because I think the experience yeah. yeah, the experience you guys put together is really straightforward from someone who doesn't know about 
this this Web3 stuff and NFTs, right? Yeah, that was the goal. It was to just make it so like it's a, just fun. You know, it's a no brainer, you know, and we've also done stuff like with certain brands like leaderboards and like other cool stuff just to gamify, just to create fun around using the technology. But then I think as we start to see more adoption, we'll see the secondary market come out. We'll start to see fan to fan messaging. So, you know, you might go to a festival or see a show and suddenly be able to be in a group of people who, you know, were in that room last night, you know. Um, you know, posting video and doing all the cool stuff. So you we'll, we'll continue to see the evolution. I like so that last thing you. Sorry to jump on you real quick. Just the the, the last thing you mentioned. I I think about it as audience composability. Like if we were all at that fish show last night and we saw that amazing thing, we experienced something that no one else did. We're connected a little bit, right? It'd be nice to yeah. maintain that connectivity, right? That's a really cool idea. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it, once again, it gets back to the whole gated community thing where like certain things, if you are gating people in and gating people out um, work and certain don't, if you have a group that all had the exact same three or four hour experience just now, we all just left and now we're all that, you know, it's something that actually makes a lot of sense. I it'll probably... Uh, it's funny, early on, I thought that that would kind of get adopted by like, you know, the, some of the social channels, but maybe they just don't care. But yeah, that, that's, that's some of the stuff. It's cool. Mark, you were going to say something. Yeah. So it's, it's superb for the, for the artist, for the fan. It's like, as I think you said, it's a no brainer for the fan. It just creates memories. It creates entertainment. What about the venues themselves? I mean, like the, and this is if I'm understanding it correctly, like what did they or what will they get out of it? Why would they jo join the movement like a venue if it was an independent venue? What would be in it for them? How would they fit into the to the model? Yeah, so um, right now venues deal with a very high level of fraud. Okay. So what that means is right now not to get too granular, but secondary markets, StubHub, SeatGeek, Vivid, um, all the others are fragmented. They're not speaking to each other. So the same inventory gets listed across all of them. All of the ticket brokers have technology. They have programs that when they have a ticket, they'll hit sell and they can literally be like, all right, SeatGeek, it's 295 and on StubHub, it's 301 and like, we'll see where we get the hit, right? Um, on that particular concert and it's all in one touch one one dashboard and they list everything right so there's a high probability if you're buying it's happened to me personally on SeatGeek one time um, where two people buy the same ticket especially if it's like an hour before the show or something and like and then it's just a race to who's going to scan it first <laughs> so yeah if the other person scans it first you're going to show up and they're going to tell you your ticket is not real or has already been used or things like that. So they benefit from that. So they also benefit where, because on the blockchain, there's only one copy of something and it's provable that there's one of them. So if there's one, it needs to be moved from this person to that person, not just like sent a QR code that whoever gets it first, because two people were trying to sell it. It was in both stores and they both sold it at the same time within a few minutes of each other. You know, so the person couldn't delist it. Um, so there's that going on. Um, there's most important really is um, knowing who your customer is. So right now, whoever is in the seats at a game or a concert, the artist, the venue, some the ticketing company we'll talk about in a second just because of the antiquated technology, but the, the venue, the artist, they don't know who those fans are. So you might do 12,000 people a night on a tour, hit like half a million people through a tour, and you have no interaction, no database. You don't know who the hell were in those seats, right? The ticketing company claims they do, but every artist I've ever spoken to has told me they've never seen a page of data. Like, it like it's told, yeah, we'll get it to you, but it never comes. And, and uh, the other thing is because of the same scenario with the secondaries, like if I like they're, they're getting sold to different end users, you don't know who they are. Like our technology like tells you every person that literally scanned into the venue. 
that's important. yeah it, yeah and that's that's powerful stuff and, the, and and if it's used the right way it can cultivate and grow a community like like no one else can like if you if you if you do it the right way right well venues are very much part of communities aren't they so they mm -hmm. kind of have the the upside of this is that they become a stronger more powerful trusted part of the yeah. community that they but they're especially outside of the bigger cities perhaps where there's only one venue where I can I, that's Mark that's so spot on because like think like when you think venue don't just think like your biggest arena or stadium yeah. think like the cool spot you go to see bands and drink beers with your friends yeah like that's some place that if you frequent it and you're in a, a town and that's like one of your spots and if any good band is coming through and you're going to go see whatever your genre is or cross genre like you want to be part of that community. Don't you want first offers when like some hot bands coming through and like, Hell yeah. when you want to be recognized as a good patron, like it goes back to almost like the cheers model. Like, you know, you want to be someplace where they know your name, you know? Yeah. And that, that's, that gets me thinking to something else is, is, you know, with your API model and your, and your white label service for the, for this tech, which of the, which of the folks are you leaning into the most? Is it the artist? Is it the venue? Is it in between or is it all? It's probably a little bit of all of them, I would guess. So here, also, I'll tell you guys. So we've had endless inquiries from artists. And early, you know, I had mentioned to you guys about, you know, you know, Ticketmaster Live Nation, early investors and coming out of the pandemic as Web3 came about really 21 in, and most really 22 also, or it, not not as much in 22, but really 21, we had every artist you could think of coming to us wanting to issue tickets with us. And a lot of them, because of the Ticketmaster investor, thought that we could issue on, on their platform, which, but we can't. Um, you know, they, they are very, very, um, you know, territorial about tickets staying on their platform. And every artist wants to be using this tech. It's bonkers. The problem has been, once again, the exclusive venue contracts, Ticketmaster owning about 80%, um, there being a few other players in there, um, and them just not having this tech. So that's why, as a company, we're now looking to partner with these companies and give them this tech instantly where they could roll it out and allow the fans that want to buy these types of tickets and be in this type of environment to use them. And hopefully, eventually, this will just become the only way to buy tickets because it really should be. That makes a lot of sense. It's 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 difficult when you have when a large part of adoption and success is driven by changing such a fundamental innate industry behavior, right? That's 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 not changeable because the the it, it serves a particular majority of that industry. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's wild, Jeremy, because like um, the experience we provide fundamentally is no different put your credit card in you buy a ticket but now your ticket just like comes to life and gives you offers and allows you to message allows you like just you know it's so fundamentally the process the flow of actually making a purchase is no different it's just like instead of it dying and like you know mark you know, like putting it in a frame you now have it in a wallet and it might good you know, if it was a ticket from a festival maybe if you want to influence some of those bands you'll get you know that and you'll have the ability to be part of something. So, you know, we'll see, you know, the bigger issue has once again, just been the fact that you have a very antiquated monopoly in place in the United States. We don't have it in the rest of the world. And we're actually seeing um, a lot more innovation in other uh, countries. One, one yeah. quick, one quick follow up on, on the idea of being able to look at the, the full transparency of the arena and say you guys are sitting section 108, row F, seat three and four. Mm -hmm. I can message the guy in seat five and be like, hey, dude, my buddies are here. Like, what's going on? Could we could we switch tickets or whatever? One approach that, that could be cool. Is there a way to, like, see how many of your friends are at a show or, or at a show in one yeah, particular yeah, night, like, through the tech? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're hitting the nail on the head. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that'd be like, just would that be a wallet check you know like where is mark .eth? where's he sitting yeah. he's here yeah. you get maybe a, a you, you start you start to build out who your 
friends are, your contacts, your different things. And then you're like, oh, look at this. These are the people whose wallets are holding tickets for tonight. And, you know, now you see them on a seating chart and you could message them. And you know what, Mark? You know, Jeremy, actually, maybe you message the guy next to Mark and he's just like, yo, uh, you know, I'm sitting here, but who are you? And next thing you know, him and Mark are friends. Totally. And like, you know, and like, you know, so that's, that's all, that's all doable today with what you guys have. Uh, a large portion of it. Some of the stuff I'm talking about is upcoming. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. I think that could be super interesting. Well, like, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Once again, it's just about adoption. Yep. That's what it is. And it's hard when you have to go after venues who just get obscene amounts of money from a company that just wants to continue having market share. And that's really it. So, um, we're fighting the good fight. We're out there trying to do it. So that's, that's kind of why we said, okay, we're not going to go fight for venues. We're going to just, power other companies and make them our be partners with them and really help them immediately enter the space and you know we'll, we'll see how that goes over the coming years it's grassroots again yeah yeah that's good though it's really good because we're passionate about it we've in my just my own opinion have built really by far the best technology in the space um, while, you know, the last two years, we've just been heads down building and testing and proof of concepting with big brands like Tau Group and MGM and Blue Note and just trying to just make it like great so it could start to scale. And I think the public is ready for change here. I agree on that. So speaking of the grassroots side, we're, we're coming to the to the edge of our time. And, you know, I think this is a good transition point to like if you were to people care, like music fans care about this stuff. Right. But they don't have a really good way to action it. <laughs> you know, to action the frustration to, to support their artists without just throwing up a hashtag on Twitter or something. Like if you could issue a call to action for music fans that, that care and want to affect change, like what could, what could they do? Um, I don't want to really have to say here what I think they should do. Besides, besides download it's, yellow heart and, and <laughs> no, it's not, it's not even that, you know, it's not even that. I mean, like fans are getting like concerts go on every day and fans are getting severely ripped off. Um, if they just refuse to participate, you know, but like, no one's going to do that. No one's like not going to go see their band because they're trying to prove a point. And that would actually be pretty not the right thing. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, the fans just trying, trying as they see this new technology come into play and they are buying their tickets up for that option. Yeah. That's all I have to say. I love it. Go, go through, download the wallet, set it up. Put your name and your nickname and your credit card and your other stuff in there and just give these communities and these tickets that keep giving and communicating a shot. And I think that fans are going to just find the experience so much better. It's like so much tech that we've lived through in our lives where you try it and you're like, oh, my God, like this is just so much better. And that's what this is. Amazing. I love it. Awesome. I love it. Well, yeah. um, Mark, any any closing thoughts or questions from your side? Um, well, well, we could spend all night. I think uh, there's a lot to to explore further. I think we spoke very much about individual concerts and individual events, and like I, I, I was a big festival goer until my kids and like the, the, the dynamic of how the tickets and how the band fan relationship works in a festival environment to a a, a venue environment. I will just go back to this because most of these tickets I actually bought from ticket touts outside the venues, a lot of them. And these are like small, we spoke about like community venues. And these were like Aston Villa Leisure Centre, um, the, the Wolfen in Wolverhampton. They were small venues and the, the touts. So I was like 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. The experience then of going to a tout, it was exciting. It added to the experience. And I wonder if this is just me thinking about tech, Jamie, it's for you. This is like tech solving a problem that tech created because back then i would never pay more than like five pounds more than the ticket price and the touts were almost like a a i don't know like imagine what those sharks where the small fish clean their teeth and they were there to kind of help the system work whereas well, with the internet those small fish that were helping became the sharks eating the other sharks and they just took it all away and i wonder if this is maybe using the web three tech to go back to a more to a healthier relationship between the venues and the fans and the bands. And I don't know. I was just Mark, thinking about that. You, well, you're on absolutely the right track because that's exactly what it does is it creates transparency that could be create oversight and regulation over that industry, which right now has zero oversight. 
So what's you're, you're spot on the way you're thinking about it. And that's how we see it is it's almost for like an uberfication of the ticket broker. So now a scalper doesn't have to be a frowned upon, down, looked down upon person. They could be what we call a trusted business partner who does great marketing and helps move inventory and, you know, takes maybe they help move two or three percent of a tour and you know and we maybe extend them a line of credit and everything's transparent and they but they can't mark up tickets 500 yeah. percent, but they can mark them up 40 percent and keep maybe 20 percent mm -hmm. of it and that's still a great margin you know so like that's how this all evolves so you're you're on the right track awesome awesome, awesome. well josh great great chatting with you again great to see you um always man. Uh, any 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 closing thoughts uh for the folks out there any anywhere that people could go check out yellow heart we'll post links and all that good yeah. stuff too yeah of course yh.io uh you know yellow heart you know that io yellowheart.com so we're out there you know we're trying to do uh you know we're, we're being picky right now on our projects and who we're working with and we're trying to just like roll this out the right way right now so um you know, ex excited for what's to come. And thank you guys for having me. Thanks Amazing. For thanks, Josh. So uh, closing, closing guys, thanks for joining us. Uh, I would encourage Josh's call to action with you. If you've never bought a ticket this way, check it out, check out the experience and, you know, maybe you'll find yourself opening up entirely new doors. Uh, artists, if you're out there and looking for a new mechanic venues, if you're looking for a new mechanic, uh, I would, I would seriously check it out as well, but thanks Josh. Uh, have a great rest of your week, sir. Thank you. Thanks, guys.